First, I'd like to introduce Dr. Amber Fletcher. Uh, Dr. Fletcher is an assistant professor in the Department of Sociology and Social Studies at the University of Regina. Her research examines how women in agricultural communities are affected by and respond to climate change and major changes in agricultural policy. She told me that she lives with a pug dog named Toaster, which made me extremely jealous. And her favorite vegetable is an eggplant, which I am not fond of. <laughs> Next is Dr. Lisa Clark. Dr. Clark holds a PhD in political science and is currently a research associate with the Department of Agricultural and Resource Economics at the University of Saskatchewan, where she is examining the political and socioeconomic dimensions of innovative, ready-to-use foods. She shared with me that she is a co-host on a feminist radio show in Saskatoon called The Laundry List, and again, I'm jealous. <laughs> um, Wendy Kubik is an associate professor of Women's and Gender Studies at Brock University, as well as an adjunct professor at the University of Regina. She is a member of the Environmental Sustainability Research Center and Social Justice and Equity Studies program at Brock University as well. She wanted me to share that although she lives in Ontario at the moment, we should not hold that against her. <laughs> she comes back to the prairie skies of Saskatchewan whenever she can. Angela Schmidt is from Red Willow Organics. She has a family farm with her children granddaughters and husband. She is currently an elected director of Sask Organics and has participated in trade missions to other countries over the last three years as a member of the Saskatchewan Trade and Export Partnership. Angela told me that before she moved to the farm 30 years ago, she didn't own a pair of jeans or a pair of rubber boots and her wardrobe consisted only of business suits, high heeled shoes, and all sorts of nail polish. She looks really good today. <laughs> Check those. <laughs> Next is Lisa Mum uh, from Sprouting Seeds. Together with her parents, Jim and Maggie Mum, she runs the family farm and business. Lisa also works with the Canadian Biotechnology Action Network in their efforts to stop GM alfalfa. And she is a member of the Organic Agriculture Protection Fund Committee of Sask Organics and sits on the board of Organic Connections and also is a member of the Organic Value Chain Roundtable. And last but not least, we have Nicole Davis from Daybreak Mill. Uh, Nicole is following the fo footsteps of her family in organic agriculture. She took over the ownership of Daybreak Mill in 2012, and she told me that um, she spent a lot of time traveling and those lessons were invaluable to her, but she really wanted to bring them back to the farm. So I'm delighted to have them all here today. Let's give them a round of applause. this side of the room is going to present us with some interesting new research on the state of women in agriculture both globally and in North America. Is that right? Um, Canada. Just Canada. Just and Canada. And organics. Great. Right. Right. The floor is yours. Okay. <laughs> Thank you everyone for coming. It's uh, great to see everyone here. Um, so all of us are going to have a little piece to say. I'm going to begin and uh, then it'll be about 10 minutes I think, and then we're going to get to the dialogue discussion questions. Absolutely. Okay, so sustaining the future. So um, I'm going to give you a little global and historical context, and uh, Danielle, this morning you did a really good job of covering a lot of these things already. Um, just And what I'm trying to do here is just draw attention to the value and the um, role women play in agriculture around the world. Uh, they com Women comprise almost 40% of agricultural labor force in the developing world and 50% in some sub some sub-Saharan African countries. So though in some contexts uh, women's uh, contributions to the farm and agriculture may be less visible uh, when it comes down to the actual work being performed on farms and in agriculture women make up a significant percentage. Um, increasing productivity within female-headed farms uh, by 20 to 30 percent would raise national productivity by 2.5 to 4 percent in developing countries. And these are statistics gathered by the uh, Food and Agriculture Organization. So clearly there is a role for more work to be done and I think increasing visibility uh, is part of that. Um, and uh, increasing this productivity could, at least, could lift um, 150 million people out of poverty, and, or poverty and chronic, hun ugh, chronic hunger and uh, Danielle touched on these issues earlier today. So clearly it's not, I mean, we're, we're talking about Saskatchewan and Canada, but um, there's bigger global issues and uh, a bigger historical context 
play. Um, so historically, uh, women didn't have access to credit, and this is also true in a lot of countries today. Uh, lack of access to credit to purchase large uh, areas of land, but also finance, microfinancing is also an issue in a lot of developing countries. Um, and, and in the early days, uh, 1960s in North America at least, uh, organic farming was an ideal way to grow a variety of food uh, in a small area without a lot of money. So women were on the front lines of organic agriculture early on because of the sheer fact that it didn't cost as much to produce organic food. You didn't have to buy expensive machinery, uh, pesticides, etc. So um, I've looked at, in, in some of my research, uh, the role of the feminist movement in um, the emerging organic movement in North America and uh, Europe in the 1960s. And one of the kind of strong links that I found was this uh, idea that the feminist movement, I said recognized, but it should be recognizes <laughs> process, because it still exists. Um, and I think that linking process uh, in terms of labor um, and uh, food had made a strong connection between the feminist movement and organic organic agriculture. And unlike other uh, agricultural movements of the 1960s, such as the sustainable agriculture movement, uh, there, there was more of a priority of gender equality, or at least the issues of gender and, and work uh, were more pronounced within uh, the feminist movement. So this, this link, um, sharing this notion of, of process, and this idea that process is an integral part to product, uh, I, I believe is a you know, central feature of organic agriculture and it also is a central feature of, of feminist principles and you know, feminist movement. So this is just a little factoid. Um, this, is, this is a fact about the United States. So uh, between 1993 and 2003, approximately 22% of organic producers in the US were female. I'm assuming this is much larger now, um, but uh, that's just to give you a context um, in the early 19. Uh, 1990s, early aughts, around how what uh, percentage the um, organic farming was made up by women. So I'll pass over to <coughs> Okay, so um, on this slide, you can see in Saskatchewan, female operators represent probably about 26% of all certified organic farmers. And this is higher than the percentage of female non organic farmers, which are about 22%. Uh, women are about 33% of the transitioning farms, and Canada-wide women are about 30% of all organic farmers, 37% of transitioning compared to about 27% of non-organic. So what we're seeing is we're seeing this trajectory of women in organic farming is increasing. So um, <clears throat> this is good that they're increasing. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> this quote on this slide, uh, this is from one of the interviews that I conducted when I was doing my research, uh, my PhD research on farm women in Saskatchewan, and that was about 15 years ago. And uh, when I, I also asked women how they perceived their roles on the farm, and these were the answers that I received. Amber conducted her research on farm women in 2011 and she still found very similar answers there, that women were not acknowledged and there was a lack of recognition for women in farming. So this is still one of the problems that we're facing and one of the reasons why we're really happy that this panel is happening. Uh, women in organic farming and all farming need to be recognized and acknowledged. So when we were looking at this, well, probably about a half a year ago, um, that was one of the problems that we were facing. So um, fortunately, we had a bit of money, and we commissioned two special runs from Stats Canada and asked them to give us some statistics broken down by sex, and we asked for a number of what are women on organic farming raising, how much, what, how big are the farms that they're living on, and a number of these other questions. So Amber will share some of these results with you. So from the analysis that we've done so far of the special run data from Stat Canada, uh, we have found, probably not surprisingly, that women's organic farms do tend to be smaller on average than men's. This is a trend, though, that we see throughout agriculture here in Canada. So it's not just organic farms. It's, um, it's all kinds of farms in Canada. 
Um, so we found that at the national level, so across Canada, women-operated organic farms were about 35% the size of men's organic farms. So still um, definitely some notable differences there in terms of the, the size disparity. Um, however, that being said, we're here in Saskatchewan, so it is notable that organic female farmers in Saskatchewan do tend to rise above the national average in terms of farm size vis-a-vis -vis men. Uh, so they're almost at half the size as opposed to 35 percent, um, which is something. If, if we're considering farm size to be um, something significant and, and something really important, and we're going to talk about income in just a couple minutes, which is maybe a, a better indicator. Uh, when it comes to non-organic, again, the statistics are basically the same, except we do see in Saskatchewan far women's farms being a little bit smaller in relation to men's. So certainly there's that. There's a, it's getting closer to parity of farm size in the organic sector more quickly than in the non-organic sector. Um, so in terms of income, of course, as one of the speakers said earlier today, money is, of course, of interest to all of us. So let's look at a little bit of information about income. Um, so what we see in this particular chart is a breakdown of female organic, female operated organic farms, male operated organic farms, um, female operated non-organic, and male operated non-organic. Keeping in mind, however, that since 1991, it has been possible to report multiple farm operators for a single operation on the census. So not this doesn't necessarily mean solely female operated or solely male operated, but still breaking down the data by sex, sex disaggregated data, does give us some interesting findings. And so what we found, you can see here on the chart, hopefully it's not too small, we have female operated farms in blue and in red. The blue ones are the female operated organics. And then we have men's male operated farms in green and in purple. And so we have the male operated organic farms in green. So you might want to pay attention maybe to the blue and to the green, which indicate the organic farmers. But what's interesting here, I think, is that if we look at income and if we look at who's really overrepresented in those really low income categories, we do see that it is the female operated farms that tend to be really highly represented in that low income category. As we go forward into the larger income categories, we see the number of women decrease and the number of men increase. So certainly we can say that women's farms tend to be not making as, as much money as men's. Um, so, however, amongst the higher income farms though, or actually, sorry, amongst the lower income farms, if we look at the differences between the organic female operated and the non-organic female operated. It's actually a really interesting finding there because you see that female organic, so the line in blue, actually tends to be less represented amongst the lower income farmers, which means that if we're just looking at farms run by women or where women are reporting being operators, actually the organic ones are doing better financially than the non-organic ones. So something that might be of interest to, to those of us in, in this room. Um, however, it's important to note that once we get into the really high income categories, so the, what we might call the million dollar farms, definitely a lot of representation by men in that category, which is significant for us to know. And of course, the non-organic farms do tend to rise up in those really high income categories. That being said, um, particularly for men, organic seems to be offering a fairly good income there. You can see that the green line, the male operated organic farms, do tend to be fairly sustained throughout the middle and the high income categories. Too. So organics is, uh, the bottom line I think we can say is that organic, it's possible, we're just looking at these statistics, that organic production is offering some kind of protection, perhaps some kind of buffer against falling into the really low income categories. So that's something we can observe there. I'm going to use some Saskatchewan specifics. So that was Canada focused data. Going into Saskatchewan, um, we do see here that for the most part, with the exception of the 100K to 249K category, it's female organic producers that are doing better financially than non organic female producers. So here are the female organic producers tending to um, really come out ahead financially, which is, again, I think very interesting for, for those of us in the room. Uh, that said, in Saskatchewan, non-organic male <coughs> operated farms certainly dominate the high income categories again. And again, we see that male operated organic farms do tend to sit around the middle income categories. And 
finally, just for the sake of comparison, some Ontario-specific data, Ontario being one of the areas we're interested in for our current research that Wendy and I are conducting. And you can actually see, if you look at the low-income category, you actually see a flip in terms of the female organic more represented than the non -or female non-organic in that category. Um, so this is something interesting to you that maybe could be investigated with further research or perhaps using different methods to find out why that flip does occur and what makes it very different from Saskatchewan. Uh, again, what we see in this category is the definitely the female farm, female operated farm incomes in general, whether organic or non-organic, do tend to dominate in those low income categories and as we go up, the number of female farmers there decreases. So we're, we're continuing to see some sex-based disparities in terms of income and this is certainly something that's important for us to address. So, we leave you with just a couple of, obs one observation and one question. So of course, as Wendy pointed out, the number of women in organic farming is growing. As, we in, as we're starting to see coming out of these statistics, it's possible that engaging in organic production is acting as kind of a financial buffer, a, a source of financial gain for women compared to those who aren't in organics. And the question that we might leave you with is about that. Is organic production an opportunity for female producers to make a better living and to maybe start to get out of those low income categories? So, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so what we're going to do now is we have a series of three questions that we're going to spend about 15 minutes each on and allow both sides of the room uh, to, to have some time to answer. Um, so I'm just going to start right in and you know this question of, of what contributions do women uh, currently make to organic agriculture, we just saw some of that but I, I'm interested in hearing from our, our farmers and our producers how is the experience of growing organic food different for women than men? Or, or what are some of the, the differences that you all see? Do you want to go first? Yeah, yeah. definitely. Um, so I'll just talk a little bit about my experience growing up on an organic farm and, um, and my experience returning to that organic farm in my 20s. So what, I grew up on a farm where the heavy labor was, was really shared. So my mom was responsible. She, she was in charge of all of the leaf cutter bee and that whole operation, so she would haul the hives up to the field, and that was a mother-daughter job, so that was like, from the time I was little, we would, you know, jump in the back of the truck and, and do that work. And, um, and even going back further than that, my grandmother, when my grandfather passed away, my grandmother took the farm and actually grew it and expanded it, and so I guess what I'm trying to say is I grew up in a context where the gender roles weren't really traditional. My dad loves to cook, my mom hates domestic chores, <laughs> so, um, so I, I was exposed to these kind of unusual farm roles at an early age, and I do think that that's the case for many kids growing up on organic farms. Um, I think that organic farmers see the world through a unique lens, like we're, we're the hippies, we're the radicals, we're also the business women and men who are just sick of the status quo. And so it really makes sense that a movement that challenges the status quo in terms of how farmer, in terms of farmer's relationship to the earth also would challenge the status quo in terms of gender roles. Mm -hmm. um, but all of that said, when I, when I came back to the farm in my 20s, um, I, looking back on it now, six years ago, I had a, actually quite a conservative view of, of the farm roles. Like, in my mind, my dad was the farmer. I had to come back and I had to fill in my dad's shoes. I had to learn how to operate all the equipment. I had to lift as much as him. I had to haul as much. And those were the really important pieces for me. Um, and at that time, I kind of considered the other side of farm life, like the domestic side, inferior to what I considered the real farm work. And so it's been, um, it's taken me a number of years to learn the lesson that, you know, I'm slowly learning that raising my son in a way so that he's connected to the earth and connected to the food that he eats is maybe one of the most important roles that I can have on the farm, but it's taken me a while to, to get there. Um, so. Okay. Nicole, do you want to go next? Um, sure, yeah. So, 
what what are women's how are women? Uh, so how are, how are how are how are your experiences is, uh, growing food organically? How is that different from what you see men who are doing the same thing? What are your how are your experiences different? Um, I think the way that it's perceived by other people is definitely very different, and that's not necessarily important, but it does affect the way that I see myself. Like I've had people just think it's weird for a young blonde girl to want to go out and drive a tractor. Whereas my dad drives down the road in the tractor and they're like, hey Jane, no big deal, you know? So that's definitely different, but I think in a way it can be looked at as a positive thing because breaking those molds and surprising people and showing them, yeah, a woman can actually do that, that's really, really inspiring and there's a lot of pride that comes with that. So. I think the way that it's perceived by other people is different, but I think when I go out and I'm in the tractor in the field connecting with nature, my dad has that same feeling when he does it. So when we're actually out there farming, I think the experience is the same because we look at it the same. It's how society views it that's different. That's interesting. Thank you. Angela? Well, I, I have a, a little bit of a different twist on, on our situation. Um, I was a business person in Regina and I met the love of my life and he insisted that I had to move to Arborfield, Saskatchewan, <laughs> which is exactly four hours northeast of here, right next to the forest reserve. So um, I decided, well, why not? Because it was, uh, you know, it was in the, I wanted to have a family and I did grow up in a small community. All my relatives were farmers and those were the best days of my life. So I thought, yeah, I'll go up there and we'll try it. And so four children later, um, <coughs> the career in the city was not as important as the relationship of raising these children on the land. And then I became very passionate about the quality of food that our children were eating. So for me, more of a traditional <coughs> role as the nurturing mother, um, the, the food was what drove me into further researching our farm going into organic from a conventional farm. And when we talk about statistics, I attended every conference and information session I could in the 90s to find out more about it. How could we do this from a, you know, a chemical farm? And one of the things that really impacted me at that time was a conference in the 90s in Saskatoon where one of the speakers said, that over 90% of the organic farms at that time, and I don't know whether it was Canadian-wide or whether it was Saskatchewan statistics, um, were the result of the women being the major influence on the farm going organic. <coughs> so for me, the role of women in organic agriculture is very significantly points to the fact that as the traditional nurturer of the family, um, we do care about the, the healthfulness of our families of our environment, um, and we come by that very honestly, and I don't, I don't uh, take that as a negative. I think it's, it's in our genetics to have that type of emotional connection. And as a, as a non-farmer and now a farmer, um, I now have, after 30 years being in Arborfield, Saskatchewan, um, I have developed a relationship with the soil that I wasn't aware of 30 years ago. My children have been born into that relationship. I made them all leave home when they were 18, so, because Arbor, there was other things besides Arbor Field. It's been very interesting for me to um, have them all now adults and with families return to our area and express an interest in expanding different parts of our farm. And we have two boys, two girls, and. My husband and I feel that there's an equal role for all four of our kids to play. There are endless opportunities, seed cleaning, value-added processing, um, depending on what, what your skill set is. But going back to what is women's role in the organic farm, I have a business background, and for me it was about the bottom line when we did do the conversion. We still have to make a living. We have to pay the bills. You have a land base. How does this work? So I feel that in our situation, my business background with the profitability um, as utmost important was, was very critical in, in us having a, what I would consider a successful transition into organic farming and a carefully thought out plan. Uh, I feel also what I do see is that 
um, a lot of women do end up doing a significant amount of the paperwork at the beginning. Now that may be changing as I see my grown children. That role may be changing as, as many men, uh, they're more computer literate now and taking on some of that. So I, I really, uh, but in our situation, I do all the paperwork. Um, I do love to cook organically. I love to host guests. Um, and for me, it has been determined that I am a disaster operating the equipment. <laughs> so <laughs> both my own kids and the neighbors all know it if they ever see me on a truck or a combine. So, so we've decided that I'm off the hook on, on uh, operating the equipment. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm going to turn the research side of the room. And so wh what does the research say about women's uh, contribution to organic agriculture? Can you all take turns talking about that? <clears throat> I'll, I'll, okay. um, one of the points that you made is truly backed up by the research. And that is that um, <clears throat> um, that uh, women uh, go into organic agriculture uh, because they want change to happen. They don't want their kids a lot of times exposed to chemicals. They don't want those kinds of things. So it's the impetus, what did you say, something about the 90% or something? In the 90s when I attended oh. some conference in, in Saskatoon, yeah. it was over 90% of the farms at that time. Yeah. Were the, the concept and the initiation was yeah. by and the women in, the, in a partnership. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and that is very much backed up. Well, I just speak from the United States uh, kind of research, but yeah, that, that is very much backed up by research. Mm -hmm. yeah. Continuing on today? Um, I don't know about continuing okay. on today. <laughs> okay, from the 90s. I, I did find in, in the research that I've done, and, and so I did a project specifically about women in agriculture in 2011-2012, and in the years since then I've been interviewing a lot of farmers, both men and women, and one of the things that I, I did find that I think also supports what you were saying is the women I interviewed, I would ask about motivations for one, I ask, actually I ask all of the producers about motivations for wanting to do environmental, environmentally responsible agriculture and, and what drives them to engage in certain practices. And definitely when, when talking to women, and, I, and this is, I think this is because of the roles that they play, because we do still see gender divisions of labor where women do certain tasks and men do certain tasks and it's still fairly rigid. Um, but because of that, because women are doing a really large amount of child care, for example, in their in their households, the kids are coming home from school and they're talking about recycling and they're talking about the environment and they're talking about climate change. And for and because women are doing a lot of that caregiving work for the children, they're learning things too. And that pushes them, I think, to be, be, be very environment or want to be very environmentally responsible in their practice. So I've certainly seen that very recently in this country. Well, <clears throat> just in terms of like the developing world and, and the international scene, uh, female-headed uh, farms, which the vast majority of farms headed by women are hectare or less. They're very small scale. So in many cases, organic agriculture is used out of necessity. And you can't afford um, pesticides or whatever. So it's from an efficiency and practicality perspective in terms of the greater uh, world. So it's not necessarily, I mean, the motivation is to produce as, you know, increase yields, but also um, be independent to, to produce whatever they need, the household needs. I'm interested in, in the question of, you know, so my, my initial statement to you or initial question to you all was, you know, what 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 do women contribute to organic agriculture? From your research, both sort of internationally and domestically, what are, women are producing a lot of different crops, from my experience. They're not producing just one crop. Can you talk more about that and the, the contribution that kind of food production has to families and to nutrition? <clears throat> one of the problems with this run that we did on Stats Canada, we wanted to find out what women, where women are. Um, in Ontario, uh, most of women are in greenhouse production. But the problem is, and it goes back to making sure that you're counted, um, is that our numbers were so small that we couldn't get anything statistically relevant. So we can't 
definitely say that this is what women are producing here and this is what women are doing in Saskatchewan, which was really kind of frustrating. So I thought, oh gee, this conference, we really need, because I'm sure even on that Stats Canada data, there's a lot of women that aren't being counted. They aren't saying, I'm a farmer and putting that down there. So um, I think it's really important that you count yourself and you call yourself a farmer and you say, I'm an organic farmer. And then us researchers that play around with these numbers can have some better numbers. <laughs> 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 um, I guess in general, so I'm going to speak to the international perspective, uh, women tend to control the crops that are meant for home consumption, whereas, uh, and that's just how it is in particular cultures. Um, that men control the cash crops and women control the, um, not, not, it's not a you know, blanket statement by stretching, but to generalize on, on some level. So women are more um, involved in the diversification of vegetables, fruit, that kind of thing for home consumption. More so for nutrition aspects because they're in many cases in charge of feeding the children and growing the food. And um, so there's more diversity there. Absolutely. Um, before I go to our next question, I should have said before, it's, you know, every once in a while I get to chair a panel like this or moderate a panel like this where it's all women. And I have to say, it's always interesting to me because, and this is a huge generalization, but women stick to time. You had 15 minutes for this question, and it's 15 minutes. <laughs> so I, just, I need to acknowledge that somehow because it's amazing. Um, so the next question is about where, where, where is leadership needed the most when we're talking about women in organic agriculture? What, what are we missing? Are we missing the funding? Are we missing the research, as, as we just heard a few moments ago? What's missing to really improve um, women's role or their, their recognition in organic? So what I'd like to do is go farmer, researcher, farmer, researcher. So Nicole, do you want to go first? Sure. Um, I think that, I don't know, I think women should have whatever role in agriculture that they want to have. Like if they want to do the cooking and they don't run equipment, that's totally fine. If they want to run tractors, do the seeding, all that kind of stuff, that should be considered fine too. So I think it's, I don't know that I would necessarily see this as just about women, but you could say the same about men too. Say a man wanted to stay home and cook and raise the children, that shouldn't be seen as a bad thing. We should be allowed to have whatever role that we want to, no matter what our gender is. Oh, so that's great, yeah. great, thank you. Amber? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I guess I, my answer is, is very, very similar to what Nicole said. It's, um, I think first of all, the, and something I've done in my research, something a lot of the, the research does show is that we still, as I mentioned before, we still do have very specific things that women are doing more of and very specific things that men are doing more of. And although we see that there are more, more and more women who are driving tractors and, and combining and doing the kinds of tasks that are very easily identified as agriculture, um, we're, we're starting to see more and more women doing those things. But I think at the same time, and that's great, absolutely, it, it, should be, it should be an option. It should be something that's available. Um, but at the same time, I do think that we also need to recognize the work that women are doing a lot of. The tasks like cooking meals for 10 hired workers during harvest time, to me, that's farming. Um, a, a, one of the women I interviewed talked about how much time she spent mowing all of the grass that was growing really high around the grain bins because if she didn't do that, the rodents would get in and actually eat the commodity. To me, that's farming. So all of these things, I think, are important to recognize and to value and to understand that without these kinds of things, farms would, would cease to operate and would cease to exist. And so I think there's a, there's, there's a value that needs to be placed on all of the tasks. And once that value is more equally distributed, then I think we have, we have more choice. We have um, and, and, and to create more sharing of different tasks, more, more equal power relations within the household so that everyone can decide what they want to do. And so that men, if they want to look after the children, that they can. And, and then I think we have real choices. And then I think we have a situation where everyone can do the kinds of tasks that they want to do. And I think, um, so, so I would just like to agree with what Nicole said. I think that's really important. Great, great, thank you. 
Angela? Okay, so going back to your original question, are there any barriers? Or, or so what, what's needed? What's, is it more leadership from women? Is it more leadership from policymakers? Is it more research? What, what's needed to really improve women's role in organic agriculture? In and organic agriculture. Okay, I, um, I guess I see um, in Canada and Saskatchewan that there are very few barriers to my two daughters carrying on any aspect of an, of an organic farm versus, versus our two sons. I think access to capital and financing um, is available to both. It's just a matter of um, you provide your backing, whether you're a man or a woman. I believe that um, our children have been raised in an environment where um, if you're passionate about driving equipment, I have a daughter sitting in the room who I'm not sure how many meals that she has cooked in her lifetime in our household for hired men or otherwise, uh, and she chose that that wasn't her, her um, where she wanted to be. She chose to be outside. I'm going to go right down to what, I, what do you love to do? And being a, a really huge promoter of entrepreneurship all my life and small business and some small business training, I've always advocated that if you are going to go to work at something, please be passionate about it. What is your skill? Um, I love to do paperwork and books. I love to be around people and do sales and marketing. That is the role I play in our family. As far as household chores go, my husband will cook, I'll cook, somebody will cook. Uh, those become minor roles. I think you have to, uh, and our, again going back to our family dynamics, we have kids who are really great at fixing equipment. We have other kids who are not good at fixing equipment. We have others who are very good at paperwork. We have others who will never do the paperwork. You have to look at what your skills are. Position yourself in your organic farm. And in our situation with my husband and I, we have both agreed that in our partnership, neither one of us would even want to tackle operating an organic farm on our own because there are a lot more dimensions to operating an organic farm. Um, but the bottom line is um, it is profitable and it's very satisfying. And I think you have, every farm has the opportunity to develop everyone's position and role and it will be different. As we heard from all three of us, we all play different roles in our organic farm. I think that's great. Do what you do best. Thank you. Lisa, do you want to go next? Um, well, just in terms of the leadership question, I think having a panel like this is a good start. Um, increasing visibility, not just of, you know, just telling the stories and and um, encouraging conference organizers to include panels on women in agriculture to share their stories because I think, um, you know, you have to name it to claim it type thing. And uh, once you give voice to things, then people are more aware. As Amber said, um, valuing all tasks and seeing them all as integral to farming. And if somebody doesn't cook for the group, then the farm doesn't function. So just valuing all um, contributions. Great, thank you. Our other Lisa? <laughs> um, I think that the, as Angela said, like some of this healthy food and um, you know our relationship to the earth is something that can, it can be quite intrinsic to women. And so I think that the principles that the organic movement is built on also have some links to to feminism and to some of the values that that women hold, um, you know, hold close to them. And I think that as we, it, in terms of making space for women and enhancing leadership, I think that as our movement continues to grow, we obviously want more people to be able to access healthy organic food. We obviously want more organic acres, and we we want to become more mainstream and, and part of people's daily lives. But as that happens, we need to simultaneously remember these principles of um, you know, health, fairness, care that we've built our movement on. And we need to value those. And I think if we do that, then we will continue to create a space for women and for their roles. And also, um, I really think that a big piece of organic farming is community. And sometimes we tend to forget that piece, and I think that women have a, a really important role in community building. Um, you know, family can be the, the heart of community, and so um, what I'm trying to say is sometimes, you know, in, in recent years we've had, you know, a lot of commodity price fluctuations, and we've seen farmers jump in, jump out, and I think 
to kind of alleviate that, we need to make sure that our movement it still has community at its heart because that is really going to bring us um, into the future and, and leave that space open for women. That's great. That's great. Um, I'm going to stay on this question of barriers for a minute because I don't feel like we, we got to it. I enjoyed all of these answers. I feel like they were really, really positive. But this is a, a, a panel where I'd, I'd like us to sort of explore what were the challenges. Uh, you know, you, 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 you had your husband working with you. Maybe, it, you know, you had to convince him to take on ag organic agriculture as, as part of the family farm. But what if he didn't? What if you had to, to fight for him to do that? Or what if the, the, the uh, university president at your university said, no, we're not going to see women. They're dumb. You know, I, I want to talk about some of those sorts of challenges that you all face in your work, just for a few minutes. I don't want to dwell on the negative. But have you had, for example, have you, have you had trouble getting funding? For this research, you, you mentioned a little bit about it before, like you got some funding. But is this kind of research on women in, in organic agriculture hard to fund? I don't like this. Was just a very small grant that we got, which sure. uh, anybody can apply for at our university. Uh -huh. And I hadn't applied for a grant before, so I think that's probably one of the reasons I got it because I wasn't on the, you know, already done this. <coughs> I think it would be difficult to get a larger grant. Uh -huh. um, I think probably if you wanted to do something like that, you would have to definitely have to have you know, <coughs> But I think going back again to the knowledge, which I think is so important, is because once you have that knowledge, and I'm, I'm no statistician, I'm sort of like an extra sketch with numbers. <laughs> you know? But if you have those numbers, you can lobby the government when you, because numbers talk. You know, so if you want more programming for women in, in organic agriculture, if you can go and say, here's some numbers about this. This is where women are going, you know, the numbers of women are going up in agriculture. We want some programming here. Um, that's where numbers are important. Great, great. And I think I just add to that by, I mean, absolutely agreeing that the numbers are very important for making any kind of case. Um, but what, I guess what I would like to see in one of the challenges that I've had is not necessarily in getting the funding for my research, but more in terms of conveying what I think is really valuable experience-based knowledge. So I tend to do more qualitative research, which means I do a lot of interviews, I go to women's farms or men's farms, and I sit down and talk to them and ask them questions about their lives. And I think we can gain so much important knowledge from that that can't be encapsulated in a number or a stat. And I, I guess to answer your question, I feel that there is insufficient recognition of the value of that kind of research mm -hmm. and that kind of knowledge. And I would like to see more, more value placed on that. Mm -hmm. storytelling is so important. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I would just say in terms of the funding, I think there's a lot of lip service paid to paying attention to gender and paying attention mm -hmm. to women's experiences, but I don't see that translated into funding of women's mm -hmm. research. Mm -hmm. I think there was just an article in the Global Mail today about research chairs the research chairs being overwhelmingly male and overwhelmingly white, and uh, you know we that is an identified problem that, like I said, you're going to be able to claim it, but it's true. Like if you don't have the numbers to show that this is a problem, then you can't deal with the problem unless you identify it. So funding, I think, is a huge issue. Great, thank you. I don't want to force anyone to be negative on this side of the room, so that's not possible. But tell me what pisses you off. <laughs> it's a safe space. <laughs> we, we've been almost 20 years organically farming, so I'll, I'll move back to 20 years ago. Um, we we decided, my husband did agree to try it. So good for him. Mm -hmm. I, and, and the one thing I told him that I also heard at a conference, you have to be willing to not have the neighbors talk to you anymore because <coughs> now you are going to be considered definitely not one of the guys anymore. He said, yeah, I'm, I'm okay with that. So that was the first barrier, was how, how in our family unit, how, how was the male part of the business going to be perceived by the neighbors and that isolation factor. 
Now, in our neck of the woods, there's been a lot of a lot more organic acres, and being on Sask Organics Board, we now have gathered some really significant statistics that there's over 2 million acres of certified organic land in Saskatchewan, and Saskatchewan has the most number of certified organic acres in North America. I only learned that statistic a year and a half ago, but you know what that did for me? That made me all of a sudden feel not like one isolated farmer among, we have some, a few other farmers in our area, all of a sudden I had a feeling of belonging to a community and coming to Organic Connections this year had a whole different significance for me knowing that we are part of a huge group of people who are working towards a lot of the same goals. And I'm talking about dedicated organic people who are in it for the soil nutrition for the long term, who are in it to, to feed people nutritiously. And uh, not to, I, I know I've mentioned profitability a number of times, but I, I'm meaning, of course, we have to get paid at the end of the day for our, our work. So the second barrier that I see looming today is the lack of research that would be available for our up-and-coming young farmers who are interested in transitioning to organic. And we have run um, a number of transitioning to organic <coughs> workshops in the past year, and the response has just been tremendous from this, this new age group coming back to Saskatchewan, like Lisa, coming back from her career and, and, and her, her great academic background, and now coming back to, this, to be part of this movement and, and nurture that movement. We need numbers, we need facts, we need to know where do I market my product, who are the buyers, what are they paying, um, where do I go to sell my product, because all of a sudden now, with the disappearance of the, of the Canadian Wheat Board and the traditional go to the elevator, get your check, all of a sudden you as a farmer are now a marketer, whether you want to be or not. When you come to this organic connection, whether you're looking for one or two new buyers or whether you have established buyers and now there's there's new people here, you are into sales now, which you've never had to do before as a conventional farmer. So for me, the research, the data, the websites, the information gathering in this Saskatchewan community so that we can feel part of a group of farmers, that, um, that is a barrier right now and we, we really need to cultivate that. Great, thank you. Thank you. Are you going to tell you what pisses me off? <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> well, I'm not really mad about it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I'm calling you down. <laughs> well, I totally got over it years ago. <laughs> I'm just going to tell you guys an experience that I had to show that there are gender roles that people expect us to fill. I told you guys this on our conference call, but. Um, I went to pick up our tractor from the local shop, like, I don't know, it was probably like two years after I started farming, and I'm like, oh hey, I'm here to pick up Gene Davis' tractor, and he's like, uh, the toy tractors are over there. <laughs> and I was like, no, I'm actually serious, like, I'm here to get a tractor, and he kind of like rolled his eyes at me, and then go back to the shop, and it's sitting in the shop, I have to, I have to drive it out the shop doors, which I done before and they're like are you good like do you want us to drive this out of here for you like we can pull it out and then you can then you can go out. and I'm like you guys I, I can do this I promise like it's okay so I go to drive out and they're all just sitting there like staring at me in complete awe like they've never seen anything like it before in their lives and I was mad like I was pretty mad that that guy pointed me to the toy tractor and like, who does he think he is like I don't know how to drive a tractor but they probably had never seen that before, you know? They probably never saw it, and I maybe, to me, it made me feel very proud that I could do something and shock the heck out of them. Or, and to them, maybe it made them kind of break the mold a little bit, look at it differently, like, holy crap, she did drive that tractor. You know? That's great, thank you for sharing. Yeah. <laughs> I knew you'd be good. <laughs> Lisa, what makes you mad? Um, well, I think, like, Going back to what I was saying about community, I think that Coffee Row is a really important piece of community. It's a really important mm. space where farmers can come to learn. But as a young female farmer, I wouldn't feel comfortable going to you know, Shelbrook Coffee Row and sitting down with the other farmers. And I, I would assume that that's the same situation in most small towns in Saskatchewan. And so how do, like, how do we open up that space so that young female or female farmers of any age can participate in that? And I don't think that those farming circles, like, they're very buddy-buddy, and I don't think that they're trying to overtly 
have gender discrimination. They just they're just comfortable with those guys. They've known them forever, sure. and that's just the way it is. But like I would I would really like to learn, you know, from from other farmers in my area, Absolutely. you know, and and that's that's a barrier for me for sure. Absolutely. I just want to share one example because I can't help talking when I'm in front of a group. Um, I, uh, you know, some of these things really resonate with me. The funding side, definitely, for uh, you know, not just a research around women in agriculture, but also around young people in agriculture. I have a hard time uh, sort of selling those proposals to foundations. And then, sort of on this old boys network side, as someone who travels a lot and you know, and you know, shows up at farms and a baseball cap in my hiking boots, people are like, who is this girl? What, you know, not realizing that I've had experience, that I sort of know what I'm talking about sometimes, and, you know, being able to, to go into those spaces and not feel uncomfortable uh, is, is, is challenging. So I, you know, I commend all of these women for sharing these experiences because they're difficult. And I don't think that they're, you know, men are, men experience different challenges for sure, but not these particular ones, and I think that's good for us all to remember and sort of recognize. Um, so I have one more question before we open it up, you know, to the audience and, and get to your questions. And this one is, you know, sort of what, what do you want for the future of, of women in agriculture? What are your hopes? What are your dreams? What do you, what do you think the next steps are? So Wendy, let's start with you. Um, what I would wish for, I would wish that women would be able to make a profitable living making healthy food for all communities. Very simple. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Amber, do you want to go next? Sure. Um, this is very general, but I suppose a society that values the contributions of all farmers, specifically those who are doing really great things on their operations, like organics, and particularly women. So the value. Right. Yeah, I don't know. I, I think value is important. Just everybody's contribution, whether you're male, female, whatever, is equally um, I don't know, recognized as important. Let's go down the road. Please, please, please. Sure, yeah. I, I want to see parents raise not only their sons, but their, their daughters with the tools and knowledge to take over the family farm. Um, and I want girls to have the confidence to do that. Um, I, I, as we've said before, I think that women intrinsically know the importance of growing healthy clean food, but sometimes we have to be a little bit pushy to, you know, learn how to change the oil on the tractor or weld or, or whatnot, and I, and I want to see, you know, those barriers removed. Um, and also, when I was thinking about this and, and, you know, the points that I wanted to make, I was reminded of two friends that in rural BC that are amazing farmers, and they're two women, and they're also two gay women on a farm in rural BC. So I want, to, I want us as a movement to think about how we can include mm -hmm those farmers um, and give them a place in our movement too. And, um, yeah. That's great, thank you. Um, what do I wish for the future? So I guess the experience that I had with the tractor, my, I have a niece who's five years old, she seems to be interested already. I would hope that she would never have an experience like that, that if she wanted to drive a tractor and she went to pick it up, that it would be seen as normal, She'd get the keys and carry on with her life. And I think we just need to continue to break the gender, the molds that we have made for people, not just for women, but also for men. We just need to continue allowing people space to be who they are, no matter what that looks like, and not try to fit people into boxes and say, no, you're supposed to stay home and cook. If you want to go do that, go and do it, and it's great. Just be who you are. Great, great. I would like to um, go into the majority of grocery stores and be able to buy food that is to feed all the families, that is not full, not genetically modified, that is not uh, been sprayed extensively, that's going to alter the health of people and uh, make us a healthier population. Now in Saskatchewan we export most of our grain commodities and um, so I, I would <coughs> like us to help in feeding the world in a healthy way. And the second thing that I wish for is I hope that uh, right now I have the incredible fortune of having all five of my granddaughters living within four miles of me. I get to see them every day if I really wanted to. Um, I get to help in the role of nurturing and raising <coughs> them 
and my wish would be that maybe all my grandchildren in the future um, I would have the same opportunity that they would have the have a opportunity to be raised at Carrot River Saskatchewan and uh, uh, be raised in a healthy environment and that I wouldn't have to travel 3,000 miles to <laughs> see my granddaughter or see or grandson over Skype so for me I want I want to see my extended family I want to be part of their lives it's that community that we all talked about, I think, earlier. So that's great. That's great. Um, before we turn it over to you all for questions, you know, we've been talking a lot about the need for equality for women in agriculture. But I just want us to remember uh, that women need equality in all aspects of their lives. This isn't only about agriculture. And it's not just about women. It's about helping men and boys and, and girls understand the role uh, of women in society and, and learning to value these different roles that, that women have. So thank you again to all of our panelists. It was really awesome to be up here with you. And now um, I'd just like to turn it over to questions. If you can shout them out and maybe say your name and where you're from. Sure. <laughs> First of all, oh, I'm Jamie with Commit International. I'm out of Montana. And um, first of all, thank you for this panel and this section. I think you could do a whole conference on this <laughs> for a couple days. Um, I previously was in conventional farming, and now I'm more an affiliate. I'm not really an, an active farmer, um, although we still have our land. Um, this is more for the researchers, but it's also fed by the responses, I guess. And using your initial data, you're looking at size and um, income, what other types of measurements would you be interested in looking at to sort of, um, you know, whether that might be crop diversity or connections to community or overall health and obesity, that those sorts of things, to look at, you know, what does an organic woman-owned farm look like, operated farm? <laughs> well, <during tonight. laughs> um, I, I guess for me what I would like to see is, um, I, as I kind of said before, I, I think the numbers are great I and mean, the numbers tell us all kinds of really important things, but there has not been a ton of, again, more qualitative research, more experience-based information on women specifically in organics. There's actually not a lot of research that's been done on women in agriculture in Canada in general. Um, and so I guess what I would like to see is more of the qualitative side, interview-based research, group discussions, things like, for example, what, uh, why, why are women's organic farms so much smaller? What are, what's causing that? Is it a choice? Are there benefits to maintaining a small farm size? Um, what, what are some of those benefits? Or are there barriers? And is that what we're seeing? Um, it's to kind of start to break down some of these trends and, and find out what's really going on with the people behind the numbers. I agree with that. <laughs> 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 um, I would like, um, as Amber said, more qualitative. I think that's, you find out so much more when you ask questions. And I would like to see how, <clears throat> and this was part of both Amber's and, and my research, the linking of house and farm and the overlap and why it's so difficult for women because, you know, she could be going to town to get parts, but meanwhile she's got a child with her and she's got her grocery list. So how do you divide that? That's farm work, that's home, you know, that's household work, that's child care. And I think to both of us found out such amazing things from the interviews that we did with farm women and how difficult it is to categorize that work and, and I count that work, and I think it's important that it be counted and recognized, but it's so hard. But that's what I would like to see there, some more, you know, child care, day care, needs, and what are the needs of in the rural areas that would help women farmers and, and those kinds of things. I, I guess I would just add um, something that I would like to see more of uh, research at, uh, the kind of interaction between uh, women farmers and the regulation and maybe the challenges they find that might be different than male farmers in terms of regulation. Um, I don't know, it, are, are uh, procedures, you know, are they interpreted differently or is there some, some barrier there that maybe 
we isn't identified yet in terms of how um, you know rules are made and how they're followed and that sort of type of thing. Other questions? Just one. This is for Am Amber and Wendy. So when you were doing your discussions with farm women, did you find that they undervalued what they did? Yes. Yeah. That was like one of my questions. I think, did you answer that one too, Amber? Yeah. And, they, and that little list I had there that they yeah. talked about being stereotyped so much. Yeah. And um, yeah, definitely. That's what they said, and that was uh, observation that they made about other farm women, that they are doing so much, but they don't give themselves <coughs> that value. They don't recognize that value, and they're not recognized by others as well. For, for all their contributions, and, and some of them said that people, they don't even recognize their own contributions, like they would just mm -hmm. not call that farm work when you're mm -hmm. going to town to get a part because yeah. you've got a kid with you. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't say that was farm work, and, and so they undervalue what they're doing very much. And I, I can just, uh, I, one of the major differences between Wendy's findings and my findings, so our studies were done almost exactly 10 years apart. Uh, hers in 2000, I did my data about 2004, 2003. Yeah. So about 10 years apart. And so we've been looking recently at some comparisons and to try to figure out if anything's changed. On your question, one of the key things we did notice that's changed between the two studies are that very, very few of Wendy's participants call themselves yeah. farmers. Mm -hmm. A lot of my participants call themselves farmers. Just We're just talking women, women mm -hmm. participants. So certainly the labeling I think is changing and I think that's a really positive thing. We've seen a corresponding shift in the literature from literature on farm wives to literature on farm women or women in agriculture, which I think is, is also really good. Um, but definitely despite, if you go deeper though, deeper than the labels. So I would ask the women I interview, how, how do you describe your, your job? What's your job title? And I, I got a lot of farmers. But then when you go deeper and when you start talking about things that happen and the more experience-based information, I got a lot of, well, I'm the employee. I'm the supporter. I'm the hired man. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think it's... Or the farm wife. Yeah. Or the farm wife. Or the farm wife. Yeah, the farm yeah, yeah. 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 um, So there's a, there's a bit of a discrepancy there, and although I'm really pleased to see the trend of increasingly identifying themselves as farmers, I think there's still a lot, a long way to go in terms of valuing a person's own contribution to the farm. Mm. Thank you. Great. Any hi? I just have a quick question as far as the research goes. Um, what is generally the age group that was interviewed? I think not the folks, with, because mine was done about 15 years ago, they were older, I think, than the rest of Mine were 54 on average. I don't know. Yeah, but it was an older population. Mm -hmm. I just want to make a comment on that. I, I'm Heather Schmidt, and that is my mother, and so I am young coming into the farm. I'm not married. I will share my age. I'm 25. I'm fresh out of university or college, and I went to an ag school, and most of the groups, the agricultural groups, were um, over 50% women. And a lot of my friends coming up that are still not married or just moving into marriage, you know, it's not uncommon that, oh, I was out bailing today, I was out. I think that the whole feminism, it, it, you guys have started it and it's come through and our generation is living it. And I told, like, it's still a big issue as far as things like that. Oh, you can't drive a tractor. You can drive a standard. I own a standard truck. And I own a four-horse trailer as well. And I can back that truck and trailer up better than half the men I know. So, no, they are not eligible to be my husband. But, um... <laughs> so, yes, I've had comments like that as well. But I can definitely speak on behalf of my generation's age that things have changed drastically and, and you know, it's a really positive, like, I uh, own 50% of this farm, not I'm the farm wife. Yeah, that's great. That's good. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> and you all identify yourselves as farmers, right? When you introduce yourself and they say, what do you do? You say, I'm a farmer. There's no sort of... Skitty, skittering around it, you're, you you say it, right? It does what, feel weird sometimes. Mm -hmm. It depends on the situation, but yeah, that's what I call myself. Yeah. 
Great, great. Other, hi. Uh, I'm Dag, and I'm a person trapped in the male body. Like, I love what this whole conversation is great, and I, I like actually talking about the issues, and I wish we could have male farmers do more of that. We don't see a lot of that. Um, and so I think that that's one of the things you can really bring in as well, to share and hopefully you know, that can go across um, gender. Um, but there's also, like so, some of the issues that we're up against in organic farming versus conventional farming is it's kind of like a violent system in a way. And, and sometimes that is, uh, comes from the male, whatever. You know, th there's very strong males driving, you know, the, the very aggressive types of agriculture or, or many different kinds of things in life. <clears throat> and you're kind of grasping for some of the equal power in, in, in our society. So I just hope you don't become like us. <laughs> like guard, guard against that because, because that's the value that you have. Like, don't grasp after the negative parts of what the male world has. <clears throat> grasp for the good stuff that you have, and, and claim your space in that kind of thing, right? And, and let let us all learn from it. Any? Hi. Hi. Well, I'm, I had a couple comments. One was about Coffee Row and how it's interesting. It'll be interesting to see how Coffee Row changes as the uh, baby boomers kind of move on and the next generation comes up. It'll be interesting to see how Coffee Row changes. That was something that I was thinking about. And the, the other thing that I wanted to kind of raise was about the gender wage gap that exists in across all you know, facets of, of uh, work. And I'm interested to know what the wage gap would be for female farmers or women farmers and men farmers. And I read an article recently that talked about a big issue in the wage gap is uh, women don't have negotiate or our negotiation negotiating skills are not as developed, and we generally devalue our work based um, differently than a man. So we we consider. We don't value ourselves the same as a man would. So I'm, I'm interested to know something about the wage gap. And um, Angela, you are a negotiator, right? <laughs> you do the marketing and that sort of thing. So what kind of knowledge would you pass on? Or how have you come? I guess you come from a business background, so maybe that's a little bit different. But in general, I'm just wondering about the, the gender wage gap. Well, first of all, I'd like to speak to the organic industry in general. When we went into it, uh, first of all, there had to be um, a bit of a profitability the minute you eliminated all your chemicals and your fertilizers from your operational bill. So going into uh, um, when, when we were chemical farming, um, the profit margins were slim to next to none. So in terms of um, splitting the wages there on on uh, uh, a zero balance sheet, you know, you, you know, it's just like who's 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 digging the potatoes tonight? Um, I, Do you no, think I, as a woman that getting prices would be different? Do you um, think that's a different opportunity? At all? Well, I first just wonder. Of all, I guess for me, farming is a business. Yes, I understand what Dag is saying. Women are bringing this this huge environmentally con social consciousness to what are we eating and what are we feeding our kids. But when you're going into a farm, it's a business. And I don't care if you're a woman or a man. Take a business class uh, and go and negotiate your loans with your bankers. Go and negotiate your products with the buyers. Um, I think women could have, have a, an edge on sales if sales is, is, your, is your thing. But for sure I see opportunities for women to get into value-added agriculture value-added processing for organics, packaging, design, you know, uh, marketing to, you're marketing to women who are raising children who all of a sudden when you have a baby, my experience was all of a sudden I cared about what that baby was going to eat, which was what did I eat when, when I was nursing them. Um, you have a huge population to market to, and yes, you have the edge on what do other women want in their food. 
Um, but when you're selling to a bulk buyer, mm -hmm. right, you don't really have control over those prices or no. you have to negotiate those prices, you right? You have to look around and, and the opportunities today that were not there 10 years ago um, are that you, you might have, you don't have just one buyer for this commodity and one buyer for mm -hmm. that. Um, the marketplace is, is constantly changing and you have opportunities to go to trade shows now. Your generation is extremely mobile. You can pick all kinds of events to go to where you can meet new buyers and you can market them. Um, I don't see any difference whether you're a man or a woman. I mean, bulk buyers or, or uh, you go and, and you know what it costs to produce your product. You talk to other organic farmers, and you have to make money. You can't lose money. I, I think what she's trying to get at, though, is what you talked about. When you walked into the, you know, the tractor repair shop and tried mm -hmm. to pick up your tractor, they immediately looked at you, sized you up, and dismissed you yeah. in a lot of ways. And I think that's what she's trying to get at. How do how do women organic farmers overcome that barrier? How do we get beyond, you know, them taking a, a look at you? and say, no, we're, we're not even going to negotiate with you. I think that probably happens a lot. You know, where's your dad? Where's your husband? That kind of thing. I think that speaks to a larger issue of, of you know, this is a very, it still is a very male-dominated industry. That's what it is. It's a, a male-dominated business. And so how how do we encourage men <laughs> to to start listening and valuing the, the insights and the, the knowledge that these women farmers have. And I don't think we have the answers here, but I think that's what you're, that's what you're asking, and that's such a huge question. I think that a huge part of it is, like the researcher said, that women don't generally value themselves enough. Mm -hmm. So if we're not valuing ourselves, mm -hmm. how do we expect other people to? We have to put out there that, no, you know what, my dad isn't with me, I'm here, I'm going to negotiate with you, and you don't have a choice. Like, it's maybe easier said than done, but you just got to do it. Sure. Yeah. Hi. Um, I work for Prairie Heritage Seeds, and I take a lot of the frontline calls. A lot of time when men call farmers come in, um, they're looking to speak with the owners, and not always available, and um, a lot of time, I've learned that if you say they're not in, they'll just say, okay, I'll call back. But if you push it and be like, can I ask them what, what it's regarding? And then if he tells you a bit, you can say, oh, well, then I can give you this bit of information and ask a f keep asking them questions. And then they will respond. And eventually you're having a conversation where initially they were just going to blow you off. Great advice. <laughs> Hi. Hi, I'm Dave Springer. I'm from Mom. Uh, in the Midwest and in, in the States. And over the years, I've bought a lot of grain uh, with farmers, and we have a little food processing facility down in Nebraska. And when I first started out, I was probably as scared to pick up the phone and call, you know, if you got some bar or if you got some. <laughs> and equality of men and women was something I've all, often thought about. And one of those early phone calls, I called, and uh, the farm wife answered the phone. And I said, oh, well, uh, what can I do? I said, well, I, do you have any? I asked what they had, and she said, well, yeah. And then she said, well, thank you, because most people call, and they just want to talk to my husband or whatever. <laughs> okay. So I found that like, when I call, I always ask, who handles this? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I found so often that, that the actual role is defined in the family, because it is a family farm. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the wife will say, that's my husband's or you talk to me, or you tell me what you want, and we'll talk about it. If you just ask the question, it's pretty well defined. I know I, I talked to Gene, Nicole's father, way back, and we were looking for someone to help us be hull oats. We were also looking for some heirloom barley that, uh, that Gene had. Gene made it clear. He said, look, you want to talk about oats? You talk to Nicole. Don't, don't talk to me. <laughs> you want to talk about barley, what I might grow next year, and how what I've got in the bin? I'll talk to you about that. So oftentimes, I think it's overlooked that the family determines, that husband, wife, kids, however, determine those roles. And that really calls the shots, you know. And I, I found that in a number of cases, even with popcorn people down in Iowa, the wife, Maria, handles one part, Ron handles the other part, and don't get it mixed up. 
<laughs> and, and it works. Why don't you just ask those questions? But it's what the family thinks often. Sure, sure. Any other questions? Hi. Well, I really enjoyed this panel and, and uh, discussion. And, I, and I, I wanted to sort of recognize what Lisa said about the, the politics of knowledge. My name is Michael Gertler. I, I try to teach the sociology of agriculture and rural sociology at the U of S. So. Um, you know, there's an interesting literature about the politics of knowledge and the gendered politics of knowledge and how that helps to transform agriculture in different ways and food systems. And, and uh, one of the interesting books that I've used in my classes, I don't use it anymore, it's 10 years old now, is by Michael Bell and others. And it's, it's a book about, it's called Farming for Us All. It's a pun, obviously, it's a play on words. But it's about the practical farmers of Iowa. They're sort of like organic farmers. And he's moved on to University of Wisconsin now, but then he was at Iowa State. And uh, one of the important things for this panel that, he, that they found in their research was that the masculinities were being transformed in the process of being part of this movement. And they talked about it in terms of the emergence of a dialogical versus a monological masculinity. But in terms of knowledge politics, a willingness to admit what you didn't know, a willingness to ask questions, a willingness to, to wor worry things through with others, or to, to show some, some indecision or some, some kind of uh, doubt about what you were doing. And, and so I thought that was very exciting. For me, the important product of agriculture above all is people. So I'm interested in how men might get transformed in this process. It's interesting to me that there's some hope. I don't know what is happening in this movement exactly, but I, there's some hope. Mm -hmm. Great. Hi. Question about uh, copyright. Is there no online resources where um, young organic farmers can get together? Or is that technology not being used in farming? Online organic growers or something like that? No. Nope. <laughs> there's a there's a young agrarian social this yeah. evening. Yeah. So I mean that's a start, right? But I, I don't I don't access any particular online forums, but they probably are out there maybe. I did try looking a few years ago and I found one but it, they were down somewhere deep down in the States. And it just wasn't quite exactly what I was looking for, but that was a few years ago, so things might have changed. And I do know that's how you and I first met, was Nicole had, had emailed me a number of years ago and said, let's start a forum for young female organic farmers in Saskatchewan. And I said, that, that's us, babe. That's us, babe. That's on that, do you, you don't find that Facebook or other social media tools help you to connect, like, not just to your customers, but also to other farmers? Is that the Other thing? farmers, but they're not generally the same age and gender sure. as us. Yeah. And, and nothing beats the face-to-face, -face, I'm sure, in learning. And what you're talking about with Coffee Row is, like, sharing yeah. ideas or sharing, like, this shitty thing just happened to me last week or whatever. Being able to vent to people and get feedback, I think, is what that yeah, for sure. to the table. Great. There was a question. Okay, in the back. I see you. Hi. I'm Calissa here. I uh, I farmed for ten years as a single woman farmer, and then I met my husband. From, uh, Can you stand up? Yeah, I'm so sorry. <laughs> yeah. So um, I guess I just wanted to touch a little bit on um, something that hasn't been talked about here. And that is, you know, the mass exit of women from the farm that happened in the 80s, 90s, when farming was not profitable. The women had to leave and get jobs to pay the bills. And we're still seeing the results of that, I think, and we're still feeling it. And um, it brings me to another important topic that hasn't been touched on here, which is farm policy. And how does farm policy affect women farmers, or women on the farm? I'm a big believer in family farm. I grew up on a family farm. And I can't imagine trying to farm alone. So, I mean, we, we can't be, um, we can't look at this specifically from a, a, a feminist perspective. This is, this is a, a broader social issue. 
um, about um, how does agriculture function for farmers and what are the policies that have been put in place that have created the situation that we're in and what can we do to encourage or build policies that can, you know, lay down a foundation for the family farms to be profitable, not just organic farms, but all, all farms should be able to be profitable to the point where people can choose to stay or work off the farm. I think it's an important topic, and I know um, I'm a long-time member, member of the Farmers Union, and the Farmers Union was talking about this decades ago with farm women and farm policy, and there's some really um, good research that's been done. And I think, uh, I think this is awesome, but I think we need a policy element here, because we need to see some action. And uh, there's lots of ideas, you know. I have two kids under three, and I can't farm right now. That's just the bottom line. Like you, you just can't do it. A lot of people know that. Um, there's no access to public childcare, or I mean, that just doesn't exist for us. It's, we're living in this this world where we take care of ourselves, and policy is something that can be a concrete result from something like this. Sure. I mean, I, that's a, an amazing point to bring up. It, it's too bad it's in the final minutes of this panel, but I think there's a lot to discuss there. And I, I, I would turn the question back to you. As as a young farming family, what do you want policymakers to know about your work? What do you, what 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 would you say to them if you had you know uh, uh, the representatives for, from you know your district, your your province here? What would you want them to know about what you need and, and what would make your life better as a, as a farming family? Well, I mean, I think it's, that's a, you can't talk about farm policy in, in a few seconds, but, uh, you know, we've seen policies create the situation that we're in. We saw them create the situation of women having to leave the farm and get jobs. It has totally um, expanded industrial agriculture to the point where our rural communities have been decimated, you know. I mean, we have a resurgence that's happened. But it hasn't happened. It hasn't been very long, you know. Ten years ago, it was a completely different story out there. Twenty years ago, even worse. You know, we've seen a gradual improvement, and the, the attitude towards food and agriculture has changed. But it wasn't that long ago when I would walk into a room of people my age and say I was a farmer, and I would get, you know, these responses like, why would you want to do that? Mm -hmm. um, and I think it has, it, like the gender issue plays into it. Um, agriculture policy is directed to produce, produce, produce as much crap as you possibly can. You know, we have this, uh, you know, there's this revolving door between an industry and government that is just, it's impossible to, to penetrate. Um, the people in this room are not a good cross-section of the general public, you know, so, I mean, there's, there's the, the majority of farmers in North America believe the rhetoric that you have to get bigger, you know, and the, the they follow the policy, they follow, they believe that these policies are, are being made in their best interests, and really, they're, they're decimating farmers. And now we're starting to see large farmers who have followed the rules, they're starting to get into trouble. Right, but and that's where our opportunity is, right? Because mm -hmm. they, they see the system crumbling. So well, we're a room of people who have gone the other way, right? So... But I do think that there's, you know, those farmers who look to you all now as examples because they, they see their, you know, the, the system that they followed, you know, rule by rule is, is now crumbling. So I, I think having you all here as, as, you know, mentors and advisors as they make those transitions is valuable. Sure, l let's add on one more question. Yeah. Directly following on what Calissa was saying. Um, I'm, my name is Kathy Holtzlander and I work at the National Farmers Union in the office. And, also a farmer myself, and uh, our national convention is going to be held in Saskatoon this year, November 24th to 26th. Everybody's welcome. I think the National Farmers Union and Sask Organics can work really well together because uh, the National Farmers Union is really focused on policy and bringing people together to understand and develop the ideas that we can take forward uh, collectively 
take forward with solidarity and create that force that one person working alone cannot do. The National Farmers Union is dedicated to family farming and keeping family farming in being the main way we produce our food in Canada. And ever since the establishment of the National Farmers Union, we've always had a policy role and a leadership role for women. We have a women's president, women's vice president nationally, also on our elected uh, levels all across the country and regions. We also have youth, uh, youth president, youth vice president, and all the you know governance things that flow from that. A vibrant youth, uh, NFU youth, which is involved with the Young Agrarians event that's coming this afternoon. And anyways, I'd just like to invite everybody to check out the National Farmers Union, nfu.ca, and come to our convention if you can. Great, great point to end on. Thank you so much. I want to thank our panelists again, and thank all of you for being here. For our